Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session, What's New in 2020 Diabetes Reimbursement? My name is Ryan Kuriakos, Senior Marketing Manager here at Gluco. Besides being a licensed, registered dietitian nutritionist and certified diabetes educator, Marianne is also a certified endocrinology coder and earned her MBA with a concentration in marketing. She is a nationally recognized expert in many areas of diabetes care, and especially in Medicare, managed care, and commercial payer reimbursement. In this capacity, she has worked with hundreds of healthcare professionals and entities, professional membership associations, and government agencies across the country. We're thrilled to have Marianne join us today <clears throat> to share her wealth of knowledge on today's topic. Now, without further ado, I'll pass it to Marianne. Well, hello, everybody. I, this is Mary Ann speaking. I just wanted to give a huge shout out to Gluco and Ryan and Erica and Robin and everyone over at the organization. Without their help and support, this would have not been possible. Hours and hours have been dedicated by their team to make this webinar um, come to you in this capacity at no charge. So a big shout out to them. Look at all of the benefits that we're gonna be covering today in the Medicare reimbursement rules um, some of these benefits you may not be furnishing at this point, but when we talk about tremendous talents, there's nothing stopping you from furnishing these benefits, right? I remember for the 18 years I worked in an outpatient hospital department doing diabetes education and medical nutrition therapy, and they said, oh, Marianne, you have to learn how to do CGM and insulin pumps. I nearly fell off my chair. But you know what? The more we take on those difficult challenges, the more we expand our horizons, and um, I, hope, I hope that's the case for you. In terms of this multiple choice, um, we're not gonna do a polling here. This is just kind of for fun. Medicare reimburses for 10 initial hours for which of these Part B benefits. And the reason I chose this, because think of 10 hours, that's a huge amount of time. And it is the diabetes self-management training benefit. So um, just tuck that in the back of your brain because we'll be going over some of the reimbursement rules for that really wonderful benefit. And the second question is, for the medical nutrition therapy benefit, which we call MNT, Medicare will reimburse for extra hours over and above the utilization or frequency limit when the medical necessity criteria are met. And the answer to that is true. In the MNT benefit, we can get extra hours over and above the frequency limit, unlike the DSMT, <clears throat> Diabetes Self-Management Training Benefit. So, um, and I just want to say one thing here. This is kind of a pens up moment. And when I say pens up, it means that this is not in the deck per se. Um, so you may want to jot it down. But of course, you don't have to. This is not required. A lot of people ask me, you know, Marianne, if I'm providing the diabetes self-management training benefit, DSMT, do I really have to provide the MNT benefit? And the answer is, is a resounding yes. You know, when we do DSMT, that covers multiple behavior change topics in many different areas for the patient with diabetes. Nutrition is just one of 10 topics that is covered. And it's covered as a general overview um, for one size fits all, like we, a general overview of fiber and saturated fat and carbohydrates, but nothing is individualized for the patient. In medical nutrition therapy, everything is individualized for the patient. All the nutrition therapy, um, amounts of carbohydrate, protein, fat, the meal plan in regarding to medication and, and uh, daily schedules. So they're complementary benefits. And remember that patients want to know about nutrition and meal planning the most out of all the topics we teach. And the reimbursement rates for MNT is very substantial uh, with regard to Medicare. So I'm going to promise I will not put you to sleep. I hope I don't. We're going to try to edutain you today. So this is the insurance reimbursement maze. I'm sure you're familiar with this. Enter at your own risk. Um, pretty much this is how we all think about reimbursement. It's confusing, it's complicated, it's challenging. The reimbursement rules are copious and they're constantly changing. So here is another pens up moment when I say about constantly changing. A, a good way to keep up with the Medicare changing reimbursement rules, also known as coverage guidelines, is to go to the CMS website, cms.gov, and sign up for the Medicare Learning Network newsletter, Medicare Learning Network newsletter. And it is free, it's open to anyone. You do not have to be a Medicare provider. 
to get this into your email inbox. Um, I get it twice a week. And again, you, you don't have to be a Medicare provider. And when you open the email, it will say the benefits where the rules have changed. If it doesn't apply, you're not furnishing those benefits, then you're fine. But if you see DSMT, MNT, CGM, you click on the hot link and it'll take you right to the rule that has changed. So I like to always start with, this is part of my edutaining. I call it the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. That would be the insurance company. He who wants the gold must identify all the rules. That would be us and follow all the rules. He who doesn't follow the rules will likely have to give all the gold back and pay penalties and fines. That's in an audit. He who has to give all the gold back in an audit and pay those penalties and fines will likely be out of a job. So kind of another pens up moment is that, in my opinion, about 80% of the Medicare reimbursement rules, and they are copious, for the benefits we're going to review today, about 80% of them are not reflected on the claim form when your practice entity or you submit a claim. So Medicare doesn't really know if you're following 80% of their rules. And that's why they come into your brick and mortar practice setting to do an audit, to see if the bulk of their rules are being followed when they open up the charts that they've asked you to produce. So I just wanted to emphasize that. We have to follow the rules. So let's first talk about the medical nutrition therapy benefit, which is Medicare covered. Let me just say a little caveat right now. When we go through these benefits, um, and talk about what's new in 2020, the, the, all of the copious, um, confusing details, all the reimbursement rules that will make or break your reimbursement are in the appendix section of this PowerPoint deck. Um, I believe it starts on slide 50 or 51. It says, meet your appendix, and there's a graphic of a real appendix. And that's where all the nitpicky rules are housed so that is really like um, a resource library or a Wikipedia for you to take back, back to your practice setting. Okay, so MNT, let's go over that. And we go from left to right on these slides. So you see we have five different procedure codes that you put on the claim. And again, all the details are in the meet your appendix section. But what we need to know for the review is that Medicare pays for three hours in the initial calendar year. This is a calendar year. If those three initial hours are not furnished by December 31st, they're going to be lost forever. So we have to watch our timing. And then we get two hours in subsequent calendar years. And then we get the extra hours that we talked about before, over and above the three and the two hour limit. Billing providers can be RDs, nutrition professionals, and then entities uh, to whom we've reassigned our reimbursement to. So in the hospital I worked in, uh, even though I'm the billing provider, um, I have to give permission to the hospital to bill on my behalf. And so I do that. I have to join Medicare myself as an RD and become an in-network Part B provider. And an NPI number doesn't make me a Part B provider. I have to complete a provider enrollment form, the CMS 855-I form, and get my um, PTAN, my Medicare number. And then I have to reassign my MNT reimbursement back to my employer because they're paying me an hourly rate to furnish that MNT. Um, and I do that reassignment by filling out the CMS 855R form. And I get a lot of questions on this, whether that's necessary when you're employed, and it is. It's one of the Medicare reimbursement rules. But if you're a private practice RD, then you're billing directly. Another question is, what's the difference between RDs and nutrition professionals in Medicare terms? Um, a nutrition professional in the Medicare arena, they've gotten the four-year, the same four-year baccalaureate degree that I did from an approved university curriculum. They did 900 hours of supervised experience, which we call an internship, which I did, but then they did not take the registration exam by the Commission on Dietetic Registration. And that's what makes me registered. So that is the difference here between the RD and the nutrition professional. The diagnoses that are covered are type 1, type 2, pre-dialysis renal, and kidney transplant. Key word here is pre-dialysis. If the beneficiary or Benny is on dialysis, then that beneficiary is not entitled or eligible to the MNT benefit. Regarding those extra hours, there has to be medical necessity criteria. 
So we do need another referral from Dr. Miller, and the referral has to be fully executed, and he has to sign it with his NPI number, and he has to say how many extra hours he's ordering and the medical necessity reason why. And we give you an example here. Here's another pens up moment. In the Medicare statutory language of this benefit, one of the medical necessity reasons, believe it or not, is lack of understanding of diabetic diet. And I use that one all the time. So um, four or five hours, I'd say, to order extra, not more than that, because it may set up a red flag at your Medicare administrative contractor. And your MAC, your Medicare administrative contractor, that's your regional insurance company that's contracted with Medicare to process all the claims coming out of a four or five state region. Okay, let's go to the next benefit, Diabetes Self-Management Training, or DSMT. This is a very robust benefit. You can see on the left, it pays for 10 hours in the initial 12 months. Now, here's the difference. MNT is a calendar year, three hours. DSMT is 10 hours in 12 months. And then we get two hours in subsequent years, but we have no extra hours payable. And I get questions on email all the time about extra hours and the DSMT benefit, and there are none. We have to be careful on that timing. If we don't get those 10 hours in within the 12 consecutive months, they're lost. And the clock starts ticking with the date of the first visit. Not the date of the referral, but the date of the first visit. And then we have numerous billing providers. So we have individual Part B individual providers who can bill directly. We also have entity Part B providers, like a hospital outpatient department, a clinic, a rural health clinic, a federally qualified health clinic, a skilled nursing facility, and even pharmacies. And then the rendering providers, again, it's the same individuals who can bill, okay, but it's also paraprofessionals, paraprofessionals, so, um, or what we call community health workers who can render. But for community health workers to render this benefit, they have to have training in the practice entity that is furnishing this benefit. And the training has to be documented and it has to address exactly what they're gonna be asked to do within the DSMT program. Um, the Benny has to have a diagnosis of type one or type two or GDM. And we have to prove that diagnosis with one of three different labs. Um, a lab report or a physician's chart note. And those three labs are delineated in the appendix section. So now let's talk about professional CGM. And that's gonna be different than personal CGM. Okay, professional CGM is where the Medicare Benny, and I'm, I'm just gonna say Martha, as in Martha Stewart. And we're gonna say Dr. Miller to be the provider. So Martha, um, wants, she has, you have an order for CGM from Dr. Miller, and your practice entity owns the reusable CGM hardware. That's a distinction with professional CGM. Your practice entity owns the reusable CGM hardware. In personal CGM, which Medicare pays for, Martha owns the hardware. She owns it herself. And you're doing, you're helping, you're training her on her own hardware that she purchased on her own. So for professional CGM, where you own the hardware, we have two codes. The 95250 is where you do the training and the hookup and the calibration. And you can see the rendering providers are qualified healthcare professionals like RNs and RDs with a provider referral. That's really important. But the, the Martha has to have a diagnosis of type one or type two diabetes and be on insulin or GDM on insulin. The second code, 95251, that can only build, be billed again one time per month. We have to look at the frequency limits on this. And that's the interpretation of the CGM data report. And again, only your um, providers, MDs, DOs, and mid-levels can bill for that. And only they can render the interpretation. They, okay, we can produce the report for them as an RD or RN, but only they can interpret it and then they bill for the interpretation and that's only one time a month on both of those codes. And then as a contrast, we have personal CGM, personal. And that's where Martha owns the reusable hardware. She owns the device. And you can see here, it's a different code, 95249. And that 
that billing is only allowed, it's called frequency or utilization limit. That's only one time per beneficiary in a lifetime per brand of CGM. And, you know, I hate to name brands in, in this kind of webinar. I don't want to look like I'm promoting any particular brand. But she brings in a CGM brand A, and you train her the hookup calibration, train her how to use it. And then a year later, she comes in with brand B. You can then furnish that again and bill again, 95249, because she's bringing in a different branded CGM device. But the, the billing providers and the rendering providers, and again, rendering providers are the people who actually sit down and furnish the benefit. They actually are with the patient and telling them what to do and furnishing the benefit. And again, with, with Medicare, I should also say that with all Medicare benefits, you, we all need referrals or orders, same thing, referrals or orders from the provider. And, you know, when we talk about reimbursement rules being with Medicare being copious and confusing and challenging and sometimes crazy, all the C words, oh, I, oh, I underscore that. Um, when we talk about providers, you've really got to watch the Medicare language because with the DSMT and MNT benefit, the statutory language, the Medicare language, says that only the treating provider, keyword treating provider, can order DSMT and MNT. And so that's, and so what does that mean? The treating provider is the one who's holistically managing Martha's diabetes holistically managing the diabetes as a condition. So if you had an MD ophthalmologist order DSMT, legitimately, legally, Medicare legally, we could not accept that order because the ophthalmologist is only treating the beneficiary's eyes. So you've got to look at every key word in the statutory language because it does mean something. Okay, let's look at another brand new benefit because this is what's new in 2020. And that's um, these, temp these Category 3 temporary procedure codes for implantable, implantable subcutaneous interstitial glucose sensor sy systems where um, a physician actually creates a subcutaneous pocket under the skin and implants an interstitial glucose sensor. And then there is a transmitter that is taped over that incision, and the transmitter is, is uploading all the blood glucose data automatically, and then that transmitter is sending it through Bluetooth or through the cloud into a um, telephone app or a tablet app or a computer app, all through wireless transmission. And so... We have three codes here for the creation of the pocket, the removal of, of the sensor, and then putting a new sensor in. And of course, we see that billing and rendering is only MDs and DOs, and the diagnosis, these are type one, type two, and GDM on insulin. Now, um, these next few slides give you a little, about, little information that we know so far about these three temporary codes. Um, I'm not going to go through that in detail. I just wanted you to have the information. But here's the thing. Temporary procedure codes, they're, you saw the three Roman numerals, category three temporary codes. What does that mean? It means that Medicare, CMS on the national level, doesn't really have enough information at this point to create what's called a national payment rate or a national reimbursement amount. Like we have a national payment rate for DSMT, the G codes. We have a national payment rate for each of the MNT codes, okay? For these temporary codes, they're out there and they're payable by the MACs, the Medicare Administrative Contractors in the United States, but there's no national payment rate that they're using. So that means that the MACs, the Medicare Administrative Contractors, they price the reimbursement rate for these three temporary codes. So like Novitas is one of the MACs, National Government Services is another MAC, um, oh gosh, Cahaba is another MAC, they have really strange names. So the reimbursement you get for these, if you use any of these codes, if your physicians are using them, the reimbursement rate is gonna differ from one MAC to another, but Medicare CMS will develop a national payment rate uh, moving forward. 
So just let you know how that works. Okay, let's go to the next benefit. In about five minutes, we'll take more questions. We have the intensive behavioral therapy for obesity benefit. And because that's a big mouthful, I just call that IBT, the IBT benefit, intensive behavioral therapy for obesity, IBT. I never thought in my day, uh, and I would have bet money on this in Las Vegas, that Medicare would never pay for anything obesity related. And I would be wrong. I would have lost money in Vegas. So um, this is a wonderful benefit. And again, when you think about your patients with diabetes, you should really be thinking about furnishing all of these benefits because they're all um, important. They're all critical for patient diabetes management. Uh, superb, excellent blood sugar control. The more of these benefits that your patients are eligible and entitled to, the better outcomes your patients with diabetes are going to have. And we know that the vast majority of patients with type 2 diabetes are overweight or obese. So we have two codes for this on the left. The 447 is individual, the 73 is group. So Medicare gets very specific here on frequency because of the word intensive, the word intensive. Okay, they say 22 visits every 12 consecutive months, but here's the intensive part. One visit a week during the first month and two visits a month in months two to six. So they want you to keep up that intensity level um, because there's evidence that that supports better weight reduction and weight management. So you get 22 visits though every 12 consecutive months. This is not a calendar year. The diagnosis fees, the, the ticket in for Martha, the ticket into this benefit is a BMI of 30 or more. So let's say she has it for the first 12 consecutive months and then her BMI is still at 32 in the next 12 months. She went from 34 to 32. She's eligible again for another 22 visits for another round of the IBT benefit, as long as her BMI is over 30. Now, once she's in the benefit, she's in the 22 visits and her BMI drops below 30, she's allowed to continue the benefit. So when, say visit 11, her BMI is now 29, but she's already in the benefit. She's in the movie theater. She is allowed to continue with the benefit. Now, billing providers, you see, this is really strange here where they got very specific. We have to get an order, and the order has to be from an MD or a DO enrolled in Medicare in one of these practice specialties. But the NPs, PAs, and CNSs don't enroll with a specialty. We can accept an order from them. And then the rendering who can furnish, of course, is the same as the billing, but then us as auxiliary staff. That's the term Medicare has given this. Employed by the MD or the DO, or employed in the clinic or the hospital or the FQHC. So yes, you can be in a hospital and, and furnish this benefit in a clinic and a physician practice group. All of those places of service are allowed. Okay, the diabetes prevention program benefit, which is Medicare covered. Wow, talk about a, a myriad of reimbursement rules. This one I think is, is um, by far it has the most copious, confusing reimbursement rules ever. Um, it's brand new within the Medicare system, diabetes prevention. Never thought I'd see this in my day either. But we have multiple codes because it's a bundled sort of payment structure where when the beneficiary attends a certain number of sessions, that's when the place of service bills. But let's look at the left. You have, if you're going to do the DPP under Medicare, it's called the MDPP, you have to furnish at least 16 initial weekly course sessions in year one in months one through six. You have to furnish at least six maintenance monthly course sessions, one time a month in months seven through 12. And then when you get into year two, this is a two-year benefit, when you get into year two, bottom left, you have to provide at least 12 ongoing monthly maintenance sessions in months 13 to 24. Now on billing providers, even though your hospital, your clinic, your physician practice group is already enrolled as an entity provider in Medicare, they have to re-enroll 
as an MDPP supplier in order to bill for this benefit. They have to re-enroll as a supplier. And there's a specific supplier, MDPP supplier enrollment form that the entity has to complete. What is unusual about this benefit is that non-medical entities can also enroll to furnish and bill recreation departments, churches, AAAs, a YMCA. On rendering providers, it can be lay people who go through lifestyle coach training at specific organizations that are uh, approved by the CDC to do the lifestyle coach training. And these coaches can be lay people who go through the training, but they can also be healthcare professionals. And they have to get an NPI number. If they're going to be lifestyle coaches and go through the training, Medicare requires them to have their own NPI numbers. They do not enroll as providers, but they have to get NPI numbers. So when I first looked at all of these procedure codes, I nearly fell off my chair. Um, I have This just amazed me. But you can see here with the second code that the practice, the place of service, say it's hospital, outpatient, the, the second code here, four total core sessions attended in months one through six. So it's when the, when the beneficiary, Martha, attends four core sessions in that first six months, then you build this code. You can build the top code for the first session, but then it goes to four sessions going down. It goes to nine sessions. So it's called, this is called a bundled reimbursement methodology. The other thing I want to point out um, when you look at the blue here, and when you look at codes for two course sessions, weight loss goal has not been achieved or maintained. Certain of these codes, the beneficiary does not have to have achieved a weight loss goal. When you get further down into the benefit, um, as you go further down these codes, when you get into maintenance sessions, um, the beneficiary has to have maintained at least a 5% weight loss, attended the session, and achieved and maintained a 5% weight loss in order to be paid. That's, that's toward the end of this benefit. In the middle here, the code's in the middle, where you're in that second six months of the first year, there's a sliding scale reimbursement. What I mean by that, if the beneficiary did lose the weight, you get more money. If they did not lose the weight, you get less money. You get paid either way, but you get more for the weight loss. When you get into year two in the ongoing maintenance, they have to have maintained the weight loss in order for you to be paid. So that's a really important point. Okay, chronic care management, Medicare covered, chronic care management. Okay, and we'll take questions after this one. Chronic care management is um, the ability for billing providers and rendering providers to actually furnish clinical management uh, of patients, beneficiaries with chronic diseases on the phone or texting or through email, believe it or not. Um, and the codes you're looking at at the left, they determine the minimum number of minutes that the beneficiary has gotten CCM in a calendar month. Like 99490, that code is billed when in, in a calendar month when the practice setting, the physician group has furnished 30 minutes of chronic, or I think it's actually 20 minutes of chronic care management in a calendar month. And then when you get to 99487, okay, that is 60 minutes in a calendar month of complex chronic care management. And the 99489 is an add-on for another 30 minutes of additional complex chronic care management in the calendar month. And then the G0506 is a special standalone code for the physician who spends time telling the patient and, and gearing them up for this benefit. This is all explained in the appendix section. But this is a fabulous benefit because on rendering providers, you see here that clinical staff employed by or under contract with the billing providers, hospital, FQHC, RHC, physician practice, clinical staff can furnish this benefit, can be on the phone with Martha telling them what to do with their high or low blood sugar readings. 
and that counts toward the minutes that have to be accrued in the calendar month and those minutes have to then be documented and tracked and when you get to the 20 or the 60 that's when you bill so there has to be a tracking mechanism in place the beneficiary has to have at least two chronic conditions expected to last at least 12 months or until death and there's all kinds of other reimbursement rules that's in the appendix section of your deck but again this is this is such a wonderful benefit because Martha doesn't have to come into the office you could you as an RN RD can be calling her on the phone and telling her what to do with her high and low blood glucose readings and then the minutes you spend with her then on the phone gets inputted into your tracking device and when the required minute threshold is reached at the end of the calendar month that's when the billing provider or the place of service the hospital then bills for the benefit Okay, let's go, let's hold the questions then toward, to the end. We'll get through these benefits, then we'll take all your questions. Remote patient monitoring, this is a fabulous, fabulous benefit. I'm just tickled pink every time I think about this benefit or I have to teach it. It's just, this is our future, I guess I would say that. Um, basically, what, you know, let me just flip, no, I'm not gonna do that. Let me just explain then what the remote patient monitoring benefit is about before I go through some of these details. Let me just give you a quick scenario. Um, Martha Stewart, a Medicare beneficiary, has a blood glucose read, a blood glucose meter, and she's getting blood glucose readings all day long. And that meter is technologically designed to transfer her blood glucose values wirelessly into a smartphone app or um, into a smartphone app or she takes her meter and wires it into her tablet and all of her blood glucose data is coming into the tablet and then it's gonna be transmitted into Dr. Miller's office through the tablet. Or she wires her meter into her computer and all the data from the meter is coming into the computer in a special software and it's going right into Dr. Miller's office wirelessly. So the blood glucose data from an insulin pump, a blood glucose meter, is wirelessly or through a, a cable into a computer or tablet, is being transferred into Dr. Miller's office through special, specially designed software by the vendor. And this is just fabulous. And so then Dr. Miller's office is getting this data through this computer software vendor specific software and looking at Martha's highs and lows and then they could then call her on the phone and say, we need you to adjust your care plan, adjust your meds, adjust this or adjust that. Text her, email her, um, phone call her and tell her what to adjust. Fabulous, fabulous benefit. Now, the really good news here is when the benefit was first introduced, clinical staff was not allowed to do any of the assessment, care planning, changing care plans. They could not interpret the blood glucose data coming into the software in the office. They couldn't call the patient on the phone. Everything had to be done by the MD, the DO, or the qualified non-physician practitioner. They had to render it and they had to bill for it. But Medicare got so many complaints about that saying that clinical staff, RNs, RDs, MAs, subject to their scope of practice and state licensure law should be allowed to, to actually call that patient, look at that data, interpret the data and call the patient and say, we think you should do this, Dr. Miller wants you to do this, do that within their scope of practice. And then how do we bill for this? Again, it's, it's about coming up to a certain threshold amount of minutes in each calendar month in order to bill. Okay, this is really exciting. What else has changed with Medicare? Because you're saying what's new in 2020? When this benefit was first introduced, it had to be furnished under direct supervision by the billing provider, the MD, the DO, or that qualified non-physician practitioner. And direct supervision means that Dr. Miller had to be physically in the office when the RD or the RN was furnishing the remote patient monitoring with Martha Stewart. And that made it very cumbersome. 
and they Medicare got a lot of complaints. So they just changed it this year in 2020 to general supervision, meaning Dr. Miller can be gone. He doesn't have to be in the hospital outpatient department. He doesn't have to be in, the, in his practice, his brick and mortar practice. He could be making rounds. He could be at lunch. As long as you can communicate with him through a phone or a pager, that's called general supervision. So that is a huge change that clinical staff can now do this and it's under general supervision. It's wonderful. Now in your appendix, um, there's all kinds of detail, but just really quickly, the 99453, that code is when you um, onboard the patient um, with the, the device, the, the special device that's gonna um, take in the blood glucose data transmit it wirelessly to the smartphone app, and then that data goes from the app right into Dr. Miller's office. So we have to onboard the patient with the device and training and education. So that's the 99453. The 99454, okay, is the what we call the device supply. And that can be billed once a month. The 99453 is billed only one time, the onboarding and the education. The 99454 is called the device supply. Now, that can be billed once a month, but here's the caveat for that, okay? The practice setting who's billing, they have to own that device. They have to have purchased the, the remote patient monitoring hardware, and that was an expense to them. And they're giving it to the patient to use temporarily and then to return it. And because that was an expense to them to purchase it, that's why they're able to bill 99454 once per calendar month for the device supply. The 99457, that's where the 20 minutes per calendar month is coming into play where the actual remote monitoring is happening. So once you reach that 12 minutes of monitoring with the patient on the phone, text messages, emails regarding her data, assessment, care planning, changes in the care plan. When 20 minutes are reached and you're tracking that, that's when you bill the 99457. So if the 20 minutes are reached on um, May 10th, you can bill on May 10th. You don't have to wait till May 31st. Now, a brand new code, what's new in 2020? The 99458, the 99458, brand new code, and that's for an extra 20 minutes every calendar month over and above the original 20 minutes for the 99457. So the 58 is for an additional 20 minutes in that calendar month of remote monitoring. And here's the really good news, and this is in your appendix section. This, makes, this gives me goosebumps. The 99458, that extra 20 minutes, you can actually bill that twice in the calendar month. Because that code, 99458, was given a medical unlikely edit, a mu value, medical unlikely edit of two. And that two means it can be billed twice in the calendar month, and that's the limit. So we get an extra 40 minutes over and above the 20 that the 99457 is giving us. Now, the device that's doing this um, transmitting of the data through the cloud into the hospital outpatient department, into Dr. Miller's office. It has to be FDA defined, not FDA approved, but FDA defined. Now there's a lot of confusion, just to let you know on this with providers and patients, what, what Medicare means by FDA defined. So CMS has been getting um, copious hundreds of complaints and questions what kind of devices are we talking about where data is going through the cloud, through Bluetooth, wirelessly into doctor's offices and clinics and other places of service? Can you be specific on these devices? Are we talking Fitbits? Are we talking just blood glucose meters? What are we talking about? Medi and I have this in the appendix section. Medicare actually published a statement um, in one of their transmittals that says we're aware of the confusion and we intend to publish information about the specific type of devices uh, that is intended for this benefit in the near future. So um, 
But what we know right now is that blood glucose meters and insulin pumps and CGMs that transmit data, again, wirelessly to the place of service um, is an FDA-defined device and can be used. Are we done yet? The cat says no. So the only other thing we want to go through now, because I want to save a lot of time for questions, and again, you have this wonderful appendix. Um, I'm just thrilled, tickled pink that uh, Gluco was able to include that because it, it really will be your Wikipedia. Um, these are some procedure codes not covered by Medicare, but may be covered for these types of services by your state Medicaid plan and your commercial or private health insurers. We have the 989-6061 and 62 series which is education and training for patient self-management by a qualified non-physician healthcare professional using a standardized curriculum. So it doesn't say diabetes. It doesn't say diabetes. This code is an approved code by many private insurance companies um, like United. I'm not saying that for sure. I'm just giving you an example. United, Aetna, Cigna, um, very popular code um, in the outpatient arena for patient self-management with chronic diseases. And then we have the 99078, physician or other qualified health professional qualified by education training licensure for educational services in a group setting. And here you see diabetic instructions. You know, it hurts my teeth to say diabetic, but I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm actually copying and pasting um, what the actual definition is because I want to be very correct here in this deck. So I know we should say diabetes. Just wanted to make that caveat. And then we have the preventive medicine counseling and or risk factor reduction intervention. This is getting a lot of coverage with healthcare plans, private healthcare plans, and Medicaid plans because of the push for preventive medicine within, in the area of, of healthcare reform now. Um, you know, with the quadruple aim, healthcare reform, virtual care, and prevention. That's getting a huge emphasis. And so insurance companies are stepping up to the plate and covering, um, many of them are covering these preventive medicine counseling codes. But I do have to you know, tell you at this point, for these codes not covered by Medicare, and if they co they're covered by your private or Medicaid plan, you have to identify all the reimbursement rules set by the insurer for these codes. And you say, what do you mean the reimbursement rules? Is there order required? Is there a lab requirement? Uh, how many hours? How many visits? What's the frequency? What are the places of service? That all has to be identified. And then we have all these S codes for a diabetic management program, follow-up to MD provider, non-MD provider, nurse visit, dietitian visit, group visit, I see these codes um, frequently being approved, again, by private health insurance plans. So just because Medicare wants the G codes for DSMT, G0108 and G0109, that doesn't mean that the private payer has to use those G codes. There's a whole bucket of procedure codes for diabetes management and diabetes education. And the private insurer, all the insurers, pick the codes they require on the claim. It's not our decision, it's their decision. And then we do have insulin pump initiation and instruction, but again, Medicare does not cover this. So as I mentioned before, if you're doing pump initiation and instruction, how you get paid for that, uh, my recommendation is under the DSMT benefit or under the MNT benefit, the diabetes MNT benefit. And we have weight management classes, and nutrition classes and nutrition counseling. Again, on the private side, these are very, very popular, but you have to confirm this, whether this is payable by each insurer. So are you sleepy after all that info? Probably. Know your diabetes benefits reimbursement rules now. All it takes is a little desire and strength on your part. Your patients, providers, and staff will love you for it. Do your homework, be prepared, and take the plunge. Otherwise, you're going to wake up one morning and realize you've made a significant boo-boo. These benefits exist. These are wonderful for your patients with diabetes. They're the best thing ever. They're, the, they're, they're better than sliced bread. And the more of this we furnish to our patients, the better their outcomes are going to be. 
and that we're going to reduce their mortality and their morbidity and we increase our revenue stream and that's job sustainability. Okay, Ryan, I'm going to turn it over to you for a wrap up and for more questions. Right. Thank you, Marianne, and thank you all for joining us today for our first webinar in Glucose four-part Diabetes Connected Care series. We would love your feedback on today's session. Please take a minute to share your thoughts through the survey that appears once you leave the webinar. We will be sending out the recording for today's session to all our attendees, and we will also answer any of these questions that came through the chat uh, via email. Finally, if you're interested in attending the three additional webinars we have for this year, you can reserve your seat at gluco.com webinars. Thank you all and have a great